Steve here. It's the show where I answer your questions. And this week, my first question comes from Bruce Bardup, who says, speed of response test, okay? Fast as you can. Ready? And and I will take these one at a time. Number one, three good things about Trump. A, B, C. Uh, A, he's 70 years old, so he's in the latter portion of his life. He'll be dead relatively soon. B, um, he's going to lose the election. C, the election will be over soon, which means we won't have to talk about Donald Trump as though he is in any semblance a legitimate mainstream person anymore. Uh, Number two, how good is Clinton? Uh, Seven out of ten. Seven out of ten, I would say. Uh, Three, how great is America? I'll give us a six. We've got potential. We've got room to grow. I'll say that. And I apologize for my somewhat sweaty appearance in the video. Uh, It's October, and yet it's really, really hot today. Boy, (laughs) good thing that they didn't talk about climate change at all during that debate, huh? Not that this unusually warm October has necessarily anything to do with climate change. I mean, it could just be an anomaly, right? Anyway, next question is Specific Hieroglyphics, who says, Hey, Steve, keep up the good work. Anyway, will you still be making videos whilst you're burning in hell? It'd be pretty cool to see the pro-feminist social justice crowd casually making content whilst fire is burning all over the place and demons are flying everywhere. I'd imagine Kevin Logan would make a Descent of Manosphere on Genghis Khan and Joseph Stalin. I wonder if the Rationals would include Adolf Hitler in their three-hour Google Hangouts on an eight-minute video by Anita Sarkeesian. Sadly, I think they would. What do you think? Would things be a bit more interesting? Would Google Hangouts have an eight-hour time limit in hell? Or would they be able to just go on forever? Could they do an infinite Google Hangout about Anita Sarkeesian's latest eight-minute episode of Tropes vs. Women in Video Games? I think they probably could, and I think they would. In fact, if hell is truly infinite, and once we die and we go there, we become a part of that infinity, then in a sense, right now, in the infinite dimension of hell, Um, you know, a bunch of YouTube anti-feminist douchebags are doing an infinitely long Google Hangout pissing and moaning about some YouTube video that a woman with 20 subscribers made. Uh, So yeah, I mean, in a sense, it, it won't be all that different. Terry Williams. Steve, I was talking to a friend of mine and we got onto the topic of cultural appropriation and clothing. Now, there are instances where I can see where the culture being appropriated can get upset when someone else adopts something they thought was theirs. For example, if a white male decides to dress up like a Native American for Halloween, I can see why some descendants of Native Americans would be upset. Yet, certain colleges have banned such attire for students for dress-up parties. I don't think certain costumes, even ones that may be in bad taste, should be banned outright. Then on the other side of the ideological spectrum, the same arguments are applied to women when it comes to modesty. There are people in authority telling women that they must be covered from head to toe, like in the deeply fundamentalist Islamic nations and communities, or else they will be seen as tempting the men. So my question is, is the best solution a middle ground in which people get to dress however they wish, even if it upsets other people, whilst not taking away the right of the upset people to voice their displeasure? Take blackface, for example. Society essentially polices itself in that case because enough upset people make their voices heard, especially with their wallets, and decided that non-blacks wearing blackface is looked down upon. But it isn't banned. You still find white people wearing blackface at parties and such, and then a whole lot of people get upset. I think that's where the medium lies. Thoughts? I agree with you, although I would say I don't have a huge problem with college campuses banning offensive costumes like that. I think uh, a college has every right to uh, define and enforce a dress code if it wants, especially if it feels that doing so will make a more positive and welcoming environment for members of groups that maybe have been marginalized or, or the subject of stereotypes and discrimination. I, I have no problem with that at all. Um, but in general, if we're talking about sort of society as a whole, yeah, I think it's, it's better to uh, allow people to dress how they want, allow people the opportunity to make fools of themselves uh, or to offend people. And then, as you say, in the case of blackface, hopefully society will wind up basically policing itself. The ideal situation is by marginalizing that sort of behavior, by attaching a, a social penalty to 
wearing blackface or dressing up in, in an offensive, you know, Native American costume as a non-Native American person. But by attaching that stigma to that behavior, hopefully you will be allowing people to see why it is bad. It's not just, well, we're ruining your fun. You know, you are not allowed to make fun of us because we're Native Americans or we're black people and you're not allowed to make fun of us. That's not the argument. That's not the point. And that's not the lesson that should be taken from it. The lesson is you should un try make an effort to understand and respect different cultures, especially if it's a culture that has historically been oppressed by, you know, your culture. The Nightmare Rider. Where do you draw the line between a religion and a philosophy? After listening to the Thinking Atheists podcast on Buddhism, I find myself agreeing with a lot of the general principles, and I think that trying to take life a little easier will be beneficial to my mental health without sacrificing skepticism. Seeing as it generally seems to lack any kind of magic or deities to worship, instead focusing on self-reflection, it seems to me to fit more a philosophy akin to secular humanism instead of a religion akin to Christianity or Wicca. What do you make of these differences? When does something stop being a philosophy of life and start becoming a religion? Well, obviously it's a very hazy line and some people will consider a given, you know, set of beliefs or traditions to be a religion while others would consider it more of a philosophy. A lot of it is just going to be in the eye of the beholder. I think when you talk about a religion, you're not only talking about the set of beliefs and the nature of those beliefs, but I think you also have to incorporate uh, a certain level of custom, you know, a certain level of ritual. Members of religions don't just believe in certain things. Uh, they do certain things. They take part in customs. They take part in rituals. They have ceremonies and rites. They have meetings at specific places and specific times for specific purposes. Uh, they have a, a history of their church or their group or whatever that means something to them and, and is used to connect them to something larger and to give their actions meaning in this larger context of the history of, of the faith or whatever. Um, and with a philosophy, I don't think you get as much of that you know a philosophy just a, a bare basic philosophy not a group or a practice inspired by that philosophy but just the philosophy itself uh, is a way of thinking or a way of looking at things that doesn't necessarily conscript you into doing anything specific or taking part in any specific activity whereas a religion I think and in, in as it's generally agreed upon and understood as a concept, a religion does make those uh, requests of you or those requirements of you if you want to follow the religion. Sydney 6586, do you think Hillary Clinton is being looked at so unfavorably in part because she is running against Donald Trump? It's really annoying how often I'm hearing that both candidates suck and we're screwed either way. Do you think if Hillary was running against an average Republican politician, she would be getting as much hate as she is? Maybe not quite as much, because I do think that the Trump campaign and the really toxic, loathsome quality of his of his core followers, of his, his diehard support in his base, has stirred up a lot of anti-Hillary stuff, or has, has sharpened it and has really turned up the volume on the anti-Hillary stuff. You know, the, the, the misogyny, uh, the, you know, people wearing shirts at Trump rallies that say Trump that bitch. I mean, and a lot of other stuff uh, that is just blatantly misogynistic and, and has been thrown at Hillary uh, as a result of the this, just the coarseness of the Trump campaign. I don't think we would see that um, if it weren't for the Trump candidacy. But I think there would have... No matter who Hillary Clinton ran against, there would always have been a certain amount of that, whether it would have been phrased in a more civilized tone, whether it would have been presented not quite as belligerently, uh, it would have been there. It would have been a part of the campaign because Hillary Clinton has been the target of a, a withering and unending campaign of character assassination at the hands of Republicans uh, and right-wingers in general, but Republicans. Uh, for 30 years, you know, she, she has been the, the right wing's most hated person 
since her husband was elected president, since her husband was running for president. So there would have always been a lot of anti-Hillary stuff, regardless of who her Republican opponent was. But yes, I think Trump's candidacy and the nature of that candidacy and the particular portion of the electorate that Trump's candidacy is really appealing to and connecting with and empowering and granting hopefully temporary access to the mainstream uh, has made the anti-Hillary stuff a lot harsher and a lot worse than it would have been otherwise. Joe McClory, in the video, speaking up against bigotry is hard to do, but worth it. You share stories about speaking up when other people are acting poorly to others. Would you be willing to share a few stories about times you have said something insensitive or could be taken as insensitive and what you did after you realized something you said hurt or may have hurt someone? I'll give you two. One was, and these are both from when I was much younger, but they still count. I don't let myself completely off the hook for ignorant shit that I did when I was younger. But um, when I was in, I think, middle school, when I was when I was in middle school and even a little bit up through high school, I had a homophobic streak that I am not proud of. I grew out of it, but nonetheless, that's that was a part of who I was for a time. And I remember there was a, a girl in our class who had gone to elementary school with all of us. She'd been in my class ever since I started school. And uh, she was kind of a tomboy, you know, and she, I won't tell you her name, but her name was that one of those names that could be either a boy's name or a girl's name. And people would whisper about her and say, oh, she's gay. I mean, I'm talking at this point, we you know, she, maybe we're 12 years old. Like, who even knows that they're gay when they're 12? I mean, I know some people do, but a lot of people, you know, you're still figuring out who you are. So whether she was gay or not, it may not have even been a relevant question at that time. But I remember saying to her somewhat threateningly I asked her if she was gay I said are you gay and she said no you know and it was just a really shitty bullying thing to do like the the imp the the implication behind my words were you'd better not be gay you know I hope you're not gay for your own sake because there's gonna be trouble if you are and I mean I didn't intend to do anything to her I was just being a bullying you know little twerp that's that's the long and short of it. I was just being a little asshole, just a little jerk uh, when I said this to her. And, uh, you know, it's again, it's something that I wish I hadn't done. I wish I could take it back. But there it is, you know, and I hope I, I'm, I hope that I am better than that now that I would. I, I certainly wouldn't do that to anyone today. Um, and then the other instance is another uh, homophobic thing, but this one was actually, the, the one I just told you about, I didn't come to understand and regret until many years later, but this one that I'm about to tell you about happened uh, when I was in my late teens, and it was something that was sort of a changing experience for me. I used to write uh, Batman fan fiction uh, relatively regularly, and I had a website where I would publish it, and uh, I invited other writers to come in and write stuff for me. And uh, there was a, another fan fiction writer who was writing his own separate sort of Batman fan fiction series. And uh, he wrote a few episodes, a few chapters of it. And then he emailed me asking me to take down his stories from my website because he had found something else on my website, something non-fan fiction related, just like an opinion piece that I had published that had some homophobic language in it, like some homophobic jokes or whatever. And he said, uh, I'm gay. And he told me I refuse to be associated with someone who uses my identity as a gay person as uh, a subject for, for mockery and for derision and, and, and for... Uh, denigration like I just I won't allow myself to be insulted and demeaned by the proprietor of the website that is you know publishing my stories um, and I, I I took that in like I was wise enough I guess at that point that 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 got through that meant something to me where I, I, I thought you know I am completely wrong in this you know he is completely right he has every right to be angry at me and I, I should not be saying these things. I should not be thinking these things. I am wrong and, and he is right. And um, that sort of was a huge turning point in me really shaping up my attitudes. Uh, not just where LGBTQ folks were concerned, but, but pretty much anybody who was, you know, a target of, of, of racism or bigotry or whatever in the world in which I lived. Uh, that was a big moment 
for me to sort of start to try and turn that around. So I, I'm very grateful to that person for calling me out and for standing up to me and for saying what, you, what you're doing and the way you talk about people like me is not okay. And I am not going to stick around and let you do it. Um, I think that was very important. Captain Michael, rank each of the MCU films from best to worst. Not a question, Captain Michael, but I will acquiesce. Okay, I wrote these down uh, because I just didn't want to have to have it go off from memory, and I actually put a little bit of thought into ranking the superhero movies. But anyway, okay, from best to worst MCU films. And by the way, I have omitted uh, Ant-Man and the second Thor movie because I actually haven't seen those. Uh, but other than those, I've seen all of the movies in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So here they are, from best to worst. Captain America Winter Soldier... Guardians of the Galaxy, Captain America Civil War, Avengers 1, Avengers 2, Iron Man, Captain America First Avenger, Iron Man 3, Thor, Iron Man 2, Incredible Hulk. There you go. I've just never been a fan of that uh, Edward Norton Incredible Hulk movie. Maybe it's because I didn't think there was anything wrong with the Ang Lee Incredible Hulk movie. I still think the Ang Lee Incredible Hulk movie is... Uh, awesome one of my favorite superhero movies and i just thought the, the the redo of it with the incredible hulk was just not good um but yeah that's always of the ones that are considered part of the current marvel cinematic universe that incredible hulk movie is by far my least favorite uh iron man 2 is fun you know but it's not great thor i think is a better superman movie than man of steel <laughs> but again it just isn't quite as you know, exemplary as most of the other ones, but all the other ones uh, from Iron Man 3 on up through the rest of the list have all been just really, really excellent. Not just, eh, oh, they're okay, but really, really excellent movies. Uh, really puts into perspective when you put it all in one place like that, how fucking great the Marvel Cinematic franchise has been. The Avengers franchise has been just amazing. I mean, we're at over a dozen films now. And there hasn't been, I mean, even the Incredible Hulk movie, I mean, I don't like it, but it's not like awful. It's not a terrible movie. So we've got uh, this massive, very diverse superhero franchise where there's not a shitty movie in the bunch yet. Fingers crossed. Don't, don't break the streak, Doctor Strange. Anyway. Yeah, okay. I was, I was about to get ahead of myself, uh, but... I stopped and I remembered I have to leave room for the sound effect before I lose it completely. Let's just cut this off and jump straight to the next part, which is a little something I like to call the lightning round. Ahoy, Yerno. Question. If you were on a jury considering the evidence, do you think the burden of proof has been met for Donald Trump to be found guilty of sexual assault, sexual misconduct, rape, or statutory rape? Guilty on all counts? I don't know. I do not have enough information to declare that he is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of any of those crimes. But I, uh, I would say if I were on a grand jury and I was trying to decide whether or not there is enough evidence to prosecute him, I would say definitely. Uh, but as for whether or not he's guilty or not, I don't know. I don't have enough evidence to say he is definitely guilty. But I do believe that accusers should be believed, and I do believe that there is more than enough evidence to be looking into those charges very seriously. Lucas Hackett, one angry brony. Yo, Steve, this is a little bit strange and interesting for me to ask, but what do you think? But who do you think's more psychotic in your mind? Brutus the Barber Beefcake or Sweeney Todd the Demon Barber of Fleet Street? I got to say Brutus is more psychotic because Sweeney Todd was actually doing stuff. Like he was actually killing people and he had goals and he was accomplishing things. Whereas, you know, Brutus, he was supposedly Brutus the Barber, but what, he would just cut off a little lock of most people's hair. How many hair versus hair matches did Brutus the Barber Beefcake actually have in his entire career? Not that many. If your gimmick is your Brutus the Barber and you shave like one guy's head to kick off the gimmick, you shave Adrian Adonis' head at WrestleMania 3, and then that's that's really the only high profile shaving that you do in your career as the barber. That's kind of, there's, yeah, I think Brutus is more psychotic. Why does he call himself the barber when he's not even a barber? He doesn't even shave people's heads and he's a wrestler and hair versus hair is an established, well-worn classic gimmick and he never used it. <sighs> Kevin Logan, who let the dogs out? Uh, Carlisle the cinephile let the dogs out. Kaboom play t uh, What is Baltimore like? Um, uh, it's Kaboom Splat Yuck 2. Okay, I, I, I misread that. Sorry. Kaboom Splat Yuck 2. I got that like way late. Um, what is Baltimore like? Well, I've never lived in Baltimore, so I can't tell you from that perspective what it's like. But as a person who has visited Baltimore often as a tourist, I mean, I think Baltimore is a fine town. Camden Yards is beautiful. The Inner Harbor is beautiful. I, I was there 
uh, last year for a, a wrestling show at uh, the the first Mariner Arena. I'm, Baltimore is is a fine place. You know, it's a nice place. It obviously has its problems, and there are some not very nice parts of it. There are parts that are afflicted by poverty and and, and other things, just like any major city. Uh, but Baltimore, I mean, it's it's far from a shithole. There are definitely people who are suffering there and people who need a lot of help, and there are definitely issues that desperately need to be solved. Uh, but, I mean, it's not a, it's not like a hellhole or anything. It's, it's a pretty nice place, especially if you're just visiting. Malevolent Divinity, Marvel TV Universe villains, Fisk, Kilgrave, Stokes, either or Stryker. Which one of them, including any I may have missed, do you consider to be the most compelling of the lot? No saying castle, anti-heroes don't count in regards to this. Well, I mean, Wilson Fisk, to me, and Daredevil is one of the best superhero villains ever in TV or movies or anywhere. I think um, Vincent D'Onofrio's portrayal of Fisk in the first season of Daredevil is one of the best superhero-related things I've ever seen. So I would have to go Fisk. But I really, I mean, in, in Luke Cage, I thought that both uh, Cottonmouth uh, and... Uh, Striker, Diamondback, were awesome villains in very different ways. Uh, Cottonmouth was more uh, of a well-rounded character that you could sort of relate to and seem like a real, fully realized person. And Striker, uh, Diamondback, was just more of a, a, a an, an, you know, out of his mind, deranged, over-the-top super movie, superhero movie villain. But they were both great. Uh, Patrick Dodds, Steve, if I'm not overdoing it with Star Trek questions, would you tell us what you think is the most underrated episode for each of the five live-action Star Trek series? For example, I think The Survivors is the most underrated TNG episode ever. There's got to be some unsung gems you think need attention. I'm not going to go all five because I don't have time and I just don't feel like going through all five shows like that. But for original series, I always really like the episode Patterns of Force, which is the Nazi episode. Uh, and it, I mean, that, that does get some attention. A lot of people remember the Nazi episode, but they just remember it as the Nazi episode. But I think it's a pretty good episode. And I think any time that, uh, you know, a, a popular television show reminds us that, you know, Nazis were bad and trying to redo what the Nazis did, but to take the Nazi parts out of it is a really bad idea. And especially in light of some of the things that are being said and some of the people running uh, for president in this election, I think it's always nice to be reminded that, you know, I mean, <laughs> Nazis were bad. We shouldn't be emulating Nazis. And for TNG, I love the episode A Matter of Perspective, where Commander Riker is suspected of, of blowing up a space station to kill a scientist and it's recreated on the holiday deck a couple times to sort of go through different scenarios. It's sort of like Star Trek The Next Generation's version of Rashomon and I love that episode. And that, again, that's one that doesn't get a lot of mention among like the best episodes of the show, but I think it's a really strong show. Uh, Drew White, have you ever done a video on a topic that you now regret? The only video of yours that I really took issue with is your five stupid things about suicide video. Yeah, that one. I would say that one uh, is is one that's definitely up there as ones that I, I would I would do very differently. And I probably should I should probably revisit that subject and and do a better job of it than I did the first time. I meant to do that way back when I first published that video and people came to me with concerns uh, and I just I just never got around to it and that's my own fault. But I should definitely revisit that subject. And I, my some of my early videos on Islam as well. My five stupid things about Islam and five stupid things about Muhammad. Again, things that I just I would do differently if I did them today. I think my more recent videos on. Um, Islamism and Islamophobia are a lot better than those older videos about Islam and uh, Muhammad. Robot Jones, who would win a fight between Pee Wee Herman and Mr. Bean? Uh, Pee Wee Herman would win. Never bet against the guy with a pet pterodactyl. If, if things started looking bad for Pee Wee, if Bean started to get a little bit over on him, I think Terry would just swoop in and fucking take care of business. And maybe Randy, too. You know, never, never, don't fuck with a guy who has a pet pterodactyl and a 1950s bully marionette. I mean, you just, you can't win against that guy. Jenny Alspach. Hey, Steve, nice video. So you said that you were skeptical of the claims that Hillary intimidated her husband's accusers. Just wondering, are you equally skeptical of claims of sexual assault that women are making against Donald Trump? You didn't really elaborate on how the claims against Hillary don't add up. Um, I believe... Women, I believe people in general, when they come forward and, and they accuse people of, of rape, I think that, that those are accusations that should be investigated. So I think the Trump accusers should be investigated, just as I think the Clinton accusers should be investigated. The reason why I don't think that the charges against Hillary as intimidating the women who accuse Bill hold up is because the only one that I'm aware of 
specifically is the one that Juanita Broderick says, where she says she was at a fundraiser shortly after Bill raped her, where Hillary shook her hand and like didn't let go of her hand and said, you know, thanks for everything you do. You know, and she had like a, a tone in her voice that sort of implied something threatening, like, thanks for keeping your mouth shut. Um, that to me seems like uh, something that is very open to interpretation. That, it's very easy to imagine that exchange between Juanita Broderick and Hillary Clinton as being completely innocent on Hillary's part, as something that, because Juanita Broderick was an activist and was involved with the Clintons apart from her ordeal with Bill, and it's completely possible and plausible to me that Hillary knew nothing about what had happened between Juanita Broderick and Bill Clinton and was just shaking Juanita Broderick's hand and sincerely thanking her for the work that she did. Um, I think that is a completely reasonable interpretation of that event. And what we know of Bill seems to suggest that he hid his affairs from Hillary as long as he could. So the idea that he would tell Hillary that he had raped Juanita Broderick and, and that she would then take part in this campaign to silence her and intimidate her just doesn't it just doesn't jibe with what we know of Bill Clinton's character and how he dealt with his affairs and his problems with women with his wife it just doesn't make as much sense to me uh, Carlisle the cinephile if you could create a seven member team of superheroes from any comic book universe who would you choose to be on the team and who would be the leader of the team okay I'm gonna go a Marvel DC uh team here and we'll start with Wonder Woman she will be the leader she has military experience makes sense uh, Supergirl because I'm watching her TV show now and I love Supergirl uh, Icon the great milestone comics character created by uh, Dwayne McDuffie um, uh, Spider-Man we'll get into the Marvel side now Spider-Man Luke Cage Storm and She-Hulk because you want that Hulk strength and you want kind of a Hulk presence on the team but I mean I, the Incredible Hulk is too difficult to control so you get She-Hulk on there and plus she's a lawyer so if the team ever needs legal representation there you go so that's my super team that, that's my, my cross dimensional cross universe superhero team Wonder Woman Supergirl Icon Spider-Man Luke Cage Storm and She-Hulk boom beat that people who have other hypothetical superhero teams. Hey, that's it for the questions. It's almost time for me to go, but before I do, here comes the shout out of the week. And the shout out this week goes to the amazing YouTube channel, Ranting Feminist. She, like Tom Avella, who I mentioned in the shout out last week, was a participant in the collaborative video that I also took part in, uh, Reasonable Questions for Anti-SJWs, that also featured Christy Winters and H Bomber Guy and The One Janitor and Philip Moriarty and Chrissyosity and, and uh, Michael Rollins, demotivator opinion there's a bunch of awesome people in that video and ranting feminist was one of them and she is just a great positive strong pro-feminism voice on youtube and not only does she speak out in favor of feminism and women's liberation but she is also a very strong opponent and critic of the rabid aggressive just absolutely toxic anti-feminists that are so common and so disturbingly popular and active on YouTube. So she is someone that is definitely a welcome and important voice. And I ask you to check out the YouTube channel and the work of Ranting Feminist. She's actually, despite the name, uh, she's, she's usually quite level-headed and pleasant. And I think you'll enjoy her work. If you like my stuff and you like some of the other people I've given shout outs to, I think you'll appreciate Ranting Feminist. So go check her out. Also check out, as I always ask you at this time of the video, the Let Me Listen podcast. These are podcasts that are created by the great Jason Harding, Jason with a D, the puppet master of Opinionville. There are a whole bunch of Let Me Listen podcasts at this point. There's the original Let Me Finish, which is co-hosted by Jason and Finite Atticus. There is American Monsters and How to Destroy Them, the hilarious improv comedy podcast. There is Filmtastic Voyage, the movie review podcast hosted by Mike and Alex. There is Cinetific, the podcast that looks at the scientific validity of popular films that is hosted by Professor Jason and Professor Aaron. And then, of course, there is Late Seating, the tardy movie review podcast that is hosted by Jason and me. And I mention it last because it's my favorite, because it's the one that I'm on. Uh, we look at classic films. We give them a fresh review. We decide whether the film deserves the uh, reputation that it has garnered through the years, whether it's a reputation as a great film or a terrible film. So check out all of our past episodes of Late seating check out all of the episodes of all of the awesome let me listen podcasts by going to let me listen podcasts.com you won't be sorry i'm saying it i'm giving you my guarantee 
You will not be sorry that you listened to the Let Me Listen podcast. That's it for me, everybody. I am out of here. I want to remind you, as always, to please leave a comment on this video asking me your question for next time. You can ask me anything about anything. Nothing is too serious. Nothing is too silly. I will answer as many of your questions as I possibly can in the next video. So until next time, take care, everybody. Hey folks, one more thing before I go. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like, share, and subscribe. And also please consider helping me to make more videos like this one by supporting this channel through Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash steveshives to become a patron. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.